Welcome to Spinal News, a Canadian series about activity-based therapy. I'm your host, Hope Jervis Rademeyer. We have a really interesting show today where we feature research on therapy intensity in a hospital setting, and then we move on to chat about technologies that could potentially improve the intensity of therapy towards ABT. Dr. Dominic Svogar, Dr. Chester Ho, and Dr. Laurent Boyer join us as our guests today. Our first guest is Dr. Dominic Svogar. Dominic grew up in Toronto, where he studied kinesiology at York University before moving to Vancouver to pursue an MSc at the University of British Columbia, investigating exercise response in spinal cord injury. He continued his work in SCI research, completing a PhD in the Faculty of Medicine, with work aimed at opening the black box of SCI rehabilitation. Today, Dominic works as a research coordinator of Skyre Community, an online knowledge translation resource that makes SCI research available and understandable for everyone. As we've heard on the other shows, one of the key features of ABT is providing enough intensity to stimulate neuroplasticity. Your research that discusses movement repetitions and cardiovascular stress during therapy for individuals with SCI touches on that intensity aspect of ABT. Can you tell us more about your research and what you found? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, So as you said, my research looked into physical activity during the time in rehab. And we basically broke it down into two parts, uh, two overarching parts, looking at the cardiovascular activity that people experience during rehab and looking at movement repetitions when people are in therapy. I guess I'll talk about the movement repetitions first briefly. Um, What we did is we literally observed hundreds of physical therapy and occupational therapy sessions and recorded everything that people did. And then we categorized what they did into different parts, um, upper arm movements, lower extremity movements, stepping, and that kind of thing. And we found that people didn't get many repetitions during their time in therapy in the order of between, you know, like 50 to 100, maybe to 200 for stepping and that kind of thing. So that was the range generally that people would get upper extremity and lower extremity repetitions in. And for... The second question, looking at cardiovascular activity, we had individuals wear heart rate monitors during their entire day, actually, but uh, we specifically looked at what they were doing during therapy as well with um, how their hearts were working. Because the question is, someone with SCI is coming to rehab, they're quite they're profoundly deconditioned, maybe just the activity in rehab is enough to stimulate the cardiovascular adaptation, so to be stressful enough to improve their cardiovascular fitness. And we found that that was not the case, that even though individuals felt they were working hard, it was not in a cardiovascular way. The amount of time actually spent in a zone that might benefit cardiovascular health was in the order of about five minutes out of the entire hour about. So even if someone was working very hard in that five minutes, it's just not long enough. And so there's two things there that need to be addressed. We wanted to figure out where we were on the map so we know where to go so to get a baseline of what's going on so we figured out that yeah the repetitions are where they are and the cardiovascular stress is where it is so now we know where we are and we can move forward in a logical way and potentially address those things down the line so i've actually read a lot of your research and (laughs) i was just wondering so could you estimate how many repetitions for example a person with sci might need to stimulate a significant neuroplastic change. So maybe just a ballpark figure. So we found that people were getting, for the upper extremity and and hand movements during therapy, they were getting anywhere between like about 100 perhaps repetitions on average. And the research in humans and primates and rats, has the research that showed benefits in neuroplasticity has been in the order of about 400 to about 1,500 repetitions in their protocols. So there's, there is a gap between what's going on in therapy and what's going on in the research. And the same thing occurs when you look at lower extremity exercise too. You have this range where people are getting maybe almost 200 steps around that time that they're ready to discharge, which is when they're actually most active. But the research, again, says you need, they're looking at, in, again, animal studies and some human studies too, upwards of 300 up to 2,000 steps a day for those protocols. So again, there's this gap between the, the very high numbers that you see in the research and then the reality of what you see in therapy. And there's reasons for that. So 
what would I recommend? There's not a number that I can suggest, and we didn't go out to answer that question, so I don't have a specific answer. I think the answer actually is more. <laughs> and you have to take animal research into consideration. You have to realize that it's animal research, not human research. But even the human research that's been done is, is quite a bit higher. That said, people are getting better. They are getting better from, from admission to discharge. And we just think that the improvements could be even higher when they discharge too. It's not like people are not benefiting from therapy. But teasing all those things apart is difficult because there's many things at play when they're in therapy, right? So they're getting better, but they could get even better, we think. Of course, and it is important that they're getting better. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So thinking about the intensity need- needed to achieve ABT, do you think that technology could possibly provide therapists with the means to consistently deliver that intensity? I, th- I think it, it has an important role to play um, in terms of what's going on in therapy, in terms of assisting therapy. There's, so obviously, you know, ABT is it's exercise, but it's exercise with a specific goal of addressing the potential for neuroplasticity below the injury. And so something like using functional electrical stimulation is becoming a more common, at least in my time when I was doing research at GS Strong, the FES bike started to become more used. But again, it's, it's a limited resource. It's something that's becoming more accessible as technology becomes more accessible and cheaper, that kind of thing. The way I see these technologies assisting therapists is, you know, you have things like very intensive things that require um, therapy to, therapists to be hands-on, like stepping on a treadmill, and they're actually doing the stepping, or using something like a local mat where the, the computer does the stepping for you. These are all very high entry tools so using an fps bike is more feasible in some ways because it's not as niche a piece of equipment and it frees up a therapist too because someone can get set up on a bike and then put their time in without the therapist having to be taking them every step of the way so they can put in their time so what is a good piece of equipment that therapists could start with that they could integrate into their practice so maybe an entry-level piece of equipment I think that in terms of doing quality movements for, for ABT, FES has an important part to play in terms of the lower extremity, allowing cycling movement for a significant amount of time, whereas without it, it wouldn't be possible at all or for a very short time. And even in the upper extremity, it's used to help give people that extra boost to, to form a movement that they wouldn't otherwise be able to, to complete without the FES stimulation. So that's something that I would suggest. Okay. Yeah. So we've talked a bit about technology today, but many smaller clinics simply don't have the funds or personnel to acquire and use some of the larger pieces of technology. So these places still potentially have individuals living with SCI as patients. So going back to your research, how do you think we might be able to help patients living with SCI to get those reps in or elevate their heart rate to achieve a cardiovascular training effect without using those larger pieces of equipment and technology? At the end of my research, we, we came to the conclusion that it's not just neurorehabilitation, it's also cardiovascular rehabilitation that is required for patients. And getting that cardiovascular activity is something that you do by doing something intense enough for a long enough period of time. For, so for people who have access to you know, an arm ergometer and the ability to use one, then that would be an option. You, have, you just have to put in the time and be working at a level that's hard enough where you're feeling like you're working at a moderate to heavy intensity. And for someone who has the ability to, you know, an incomplete injury who might be able to cycle on a, on a leg ergometer, that's something to consider potentially as well. There's other adapted pieces of equipment that are available, um, creational use and that kind of thing too. There's... The other question, too, of how do you get in the reps in a way that doesn't require expensive machinery? And again, in some cases, it's going to be the case that someone with a very high injury is going to be more limited than someone with a lower injury. And so not everybody's going to be able to avail themselves of, of these kind of resources. But one of the things that was uh, that successful in, in stroke rehab was something called the GRASP program. And that's kind of like a, like a homework program where people with their therapists, they have this homework program where they're not spending time in therapy doing these exercises, but they go on their own and they do, you know, resistance band movements for repetitions. They do certain exercises and they get all the repetitions in, in that way. And that would allow them to, you don't need to specifically increase therapist time, but you're still getting therapist oversight because it's kind of like a homework program. I think 
something like the GRASP, but for SCI, that kind of principle would be very useful. The GRASP is a tool for stroke for the upper extremity specifically. And so it, that principle would carry over very easily to something like a tetraplegia situation for upper extremity. The lower extremity, if you can step, go do more steps is, would be the recommendation. The only caveat there is there is a bit of a, more of a safety issue because if you are stepping unsupervised and you're not stable, there is a higher risk of falling and, and that kind of thing than there would be go do more reaches for a cup or something like that. There's less risk of injury in that case, right? It becomes an issue of like, do you have support? It often comes into play here too, where a spouse or a sibling or a caregiver can assist. So the answer is, yeah, you need to do more. You need to do it outside of PT time, probably, or OT time. And doing it with the guidance of a therapist is probably the most efficient and the smartest way to go about it. So Dr. Svogar, you're the research coordinator for the SKYRE Network. And I was wondering if you could tell our listeners a bit about what that is. Yeah. So SKYRE stands for Spinal Cord Injury Research Evidence. And it is basically two websites one is called Sky Professional, and the other one's called Sky Community, and they're like two sides of the same coin. Sky Professional is a resource geared towards clinicians, doctors, and researchers that takes the, the evidence and creates summaries that people can access. A lot of people don't have time to go through all the literature. Most people don't have time to go through all the literature. So we do that and compress it and provide information for them. Sky Community is a resource that's like Sky Professional, but we are geared towards people with SCI, their families and their caregivers. So we take some of the same research, and some of the same material from Sky Professional and, and just translate it into understandable content and make it more accessible. But we also have other stuff that we pull into, topics that we think are interesting. And so we create articles that people can access for free online. And we find that therapists find this tool useful. It comes into play during patient education. So we have modules on things like UTIs, respiratory function, autonomic dysreflexia. So all the things that are relevant to people with SCI during not only understanding the injury itself, but their time in rehab and the time after rehab out in the community. And it's a growing resource. We keep on adding content to it all the time. We have French content. We're going to be adding Greek and Spanish content in the, in the relatively near future. So take a look at the website. It's definitely a resource that you as a clinician and your clients would find useful. That sounds fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, so thank you, Dr. Zbogar, for coming in for the interview, and I look forward to hearing more about your research. Our next guest on the show today is Dr. Chester Ho. The focus of Dr. Ho's work since 2000 has been spinal cord injury rehabilitation. He is a clinician, researcher, and health services administrator, and his academic work integrates all three aspects of his career. He has a special clinical and research interest in the rehabilitation of persons with SCI, specifically on the management and rehabilitation of complications following SCI, such as pressure injuries and the use of functional electrical stimulation in the promotion of function and mobility, as well as on the health services delivery of SCI rehabilitation. A major focus of his work is on the implementation of evidence-based treatments, such as FES cycling for exercise training after SCI. He has created a regional program for the use of FES cycling and is in the process of creating international evidence-based clinical practice guidelines on the use of FES cycling after SCI. In his spare time, Dr. Ho loves gardening, and contrary to popular belief, you can have a lovely garden in Alberta. Welcome, Dr. Ho. So patients and therapists seem to be really excited about functional electrical stimulation cycling for spinal cord rehabilitation. Can you tell me a little bit about what it is and how you can use it for activity-based therapy? Sure. So after a spinal cord injury, people may lose their strength in their arms or legs. And because of this interruption in their spinal cord, right? And so signals cannot get through from their brain all the way down to their legs to affect the um, motor movements. And so with FES cycling or functional electrical stimulation cycling, we can use electrodes which we put on the skin that can directly stimulate the muscles in the legs 
to try to help people with loss of motor movements to move again. And also because it's actually um, coordinated by a computer. So it will essentially create a cycling movement, which is actually very exciting to the users. And it has been very much enjoyed by those who have tried it. So I've heard from some patients that they like to really see their legs and arms move. Is that what they like to see or is there more to that? Yeah, I think that there are um, several levels of this enjoyment that I've observed. Basically, some people would describe to me that they love seeing how their legs were working again, but also some people really uh, feel that they are exercising. And so they get the same sort of adrenaline rush uh, when they're exercising, and so they really like it. And they also describe that their mood is better. And even though it's not properly studied, but I think that we need to look into that more. Wow, that's a lot of enjoyment on different levels and definitely improvement. So obviously, you know a lot about FES and spinal cord injury. In fact, you wrote a paper on FES to provide therapeutic exercise options for different functional activities. What drew your research focus to FES cycling in particular? Yes, I um, focus on FES cycling because I feel that this is actually a modality that's quite available In fact, FES cycling is nothing new because it's been around for 20 years. But at the same time, my thinking is that how can we actually make it more available and more accessible to people? And also, um, there are still lots of research opportunities that we can have with FES cycling. That's why I like that, because if I research on something that's not accessible or available to people, I think that that may not really directly impact on uh, people with spinal cord injury as much as something that's actually potentially available and accessible to people in different parts of the world. That's true. I think that accessibility piece is very important. So can you tell me about the most exciting finding from your research on FES cycling and maybe how that applies to ABT? Yes. A lot of FES cycling research has focused on people with chronic spinal cord injury, so at least a year out of their injury. So there is actually a big gap in the knowledge as to how we can use FES cycling in people with newer injuries. And so my research right now is focusing on those with a newer injury, let's say uh, several weeks or 10 or 14 days after the injury. How can we actually use FES cycling? to, first of all, potentially enhance their neural recovery? And secondly, how can we actually use that to prevent secondary complications from occurring? When I say secondary complications, I'm referring to things like muscle atrophy or loss of their muscle bulk. And also, could we potentially keep their bones healthy so they don't become osteoporotic. So there are lots of potential benefits that we can explore with the use of FES cycling early on after people's injuries. So I think that's actually the most exciting piece that I'm working on. Wow. So now you're delving into uh, using FES cycling earlier might actually be more beneficial than targeting it later on in someone's spinal cord injury rehab. Yes, that's what I'm trying to find out. And uh, we know that from my initial study, uh, people can tolerate that well, even really uh, shortly after their injuries. And also, it has been fairly safe. So can we actually do this early on and so that we can have the benefits which I described earlier on neural recovery and also the prevention of secondary complications. And then people can continue with it during their rehab phase and also even in the community so that they really have this modality of therapy available to them all the way from their acute injury to their community reintegration. So that's what I'm hoping to achieve. I think you touched on two points that are really important to mention again, too, that you can start it early and it can be very safe for them to start early. So really interesting points there. So do you think that pairing activity-based therapy with higher level technologies in general tends to produce better functional outcomes for patients? I think that um, that's a very interesting question because it depends. 
In fact, I think that even very simple exercise training that could be classified as ABT could also potentially have very good outcomes. Because, for instance, even if we do passive cycling without FES, maybe that could also yield very good outcomes. I think there's some evidence to suggest that, but we can produce a lot more evidence. So I think that we have to look at what we're trying to effect. Maybe sometimes for some particular activities, it may require higher level technologies to support that. But for others, it could simply be some very simple exercise modality. So I think that we don't want to like just think that this is all about higher technology use, or it could also be very simple technology as well. Right. And you mentioned the access piece as well. So if someone has access to a exercise bike, or maybe they can't afford a functional electrical stimulation unit or can't get access, to, that's an important piece too, if you can just use a simpler piece of technology and still be effective. Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the reasons why in my work here in Edmonton, we focus on FES cycling is that we already have this modality of exercise available in the community. And we have also started doing that in rehab. So downstream, we already have that availability. So it makes sense for us to also study that early on after people's um, acute injuries. And that's why we are very mindful of the availability, because if we study this and people love it and they want to do it, but then it's not available later on, that's not uh, quite fair and that's not right. And so we want to make sure that we design something that really is available throughout people's journey. Great. So you are currently involved in research to develop specific guidelines that use FEF cycling for spinal rehabilitation. How does activity-based therapy fit into these guidelines? I think that it fits in really well because um, when we look at FES cycling, we do actually use a lot of the existing evidence on activity guidelines for spinal cord injury, uh, how much it should be. And also we are looking at some of the current evidence for ABT as well. So I think that they all sit in together. And even though we may be looking at these things from a different angle, or I may be focusing on this one piece, but I think that we have to look at the bigger picture. We, while we are looking at FES cycling, but it doesn't mean that people should just be focusing on this, but not on other opportunities for ABT. And I still recognize that even when we are looking at um, FES cycling, but it is still not available everywhere, right? And different places may have different availability or different types of um, ABT that's available. So while we're focusing on the FES cycling guideline, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking at other things. So I think that they all fit in nicely together in this whole issue with ABT. Thank you. And my last question for you is that your education and work has taken you all over the world. So why do you think that Canada needs activity-based therapy now? And how does the state of ABT here compare to other countries? Yeah, I think that we need ABT because basically we know that there is research to support the use of ABT for better outcomes for our patients. And also, um, from a very patient-centric standpoint, patients love it and they really enjoy ABT and find it to be beneficial. So I think that we have to look at this, uh, not just the scientific evidence, but also the uh, preferences of our patients. And so that's why I think that ABT is actually very important right now. And in terms of where Canada is comparing to the rest of the world, I can say that in some parts of the world, they may be a bit more ahead of us in terms of uh, certain ABT being used, but then it is a bit uh, still erratic. And I think that we have the advantage that in our healthcare system, we can look at things a bit more systematically. And so we're not just looking at, okay, just the um, rehab phase or just the community phase. I think that in our healthcare system, we have the advantage of being able to look at the entire spectrum or continuity of care so that we can design something that incorporates ABT all the way from acute care to rehab to communities. So I think that we are in a very unique position. 
And we also have a lot of uh, great uh, researchers looking into this too. So I think that we are in a very good place. Great. Well, thank you so much for being our guest today, Dr. Ho. Our final guest today is Dr. Laurent Boyer. Dr. Boyer received a Bachelor of Science degree in Honours Neurophysiology from McGill University in 1990, and then a PhD from the Aerospace Medical Research Unit, also at McGill. He then completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Université de Montréal on animal models of motor control after spinal cord injury. He is now a full professor in the Department of Rehabilitation at Laval University, the Director of Neuroscience Research Centre, and a researcher at the Center for Interdisciplinary Research in Rehabilitation and Social Integration. His research program focuses on motor control and motor learning. Most of his research projects are carried out in interdisciplinary teams that combine health sciences and engineering, covering many facets of rehabilitation research. His research interests include understanding the neural circuitry, underlying human movement control, measuring electromyography, and movement, improving clinical tests using wearable sensors, characterizing early indicators of muscle fatigue during complex movements, and developing new robotic technologies and software for rehabilitation. Welcome, Dr. Boyer. Thank you very much, Hope. Uh, Thank you for having me. Great. So you've been involved in research topics that involve understanding the plasticity of locomotion and evaluating locomotion after spinal cord injury. And then you moved on to take a closer look at human machine interfaces for people who have difficulty walking and also some research on exoskeletons. Can you tell me a little bit more about how these research interests evolved and where ABT fits in? Well, thank you. This is a very good question. All of my research is really based around the fact that our nervous system can learn. So there are different ways you can teach the neuromotor system to learn, and you can use activity-based therapy, which is repetitive movement of a certain intensity. And the more intensity you provide and the more repetitions you provide, you can improve the movement output. There are different ways of doing this. Uh, One way which really opened up in the last few years is through the use of exoskeletons, which are a type of robots that you can wear and that can teach you the appropriate movement. So basically, if you take someone who has lost the ability to perform a proper walking movement by putting them in these device, you can show the body what the movement should look like and then train the nervous system through the sensory pathways going into the spinal cord and into the brain, teach the proper movement pathway by repeatedly exposing them to the movement. So my research has used movement repetitions in the past. I've also studied how sensory information can enhance motor learning. And now by putting together the robots with what we know about motor learning, I think we can improve our ability and our efficiency at providing motor therapy to people with spinal cord injury. Okay. So as we learned in episode one, ABT is used to facilitate neuroplasticity. So how is the exoskeleton used to facilitate ABT? That's a very uh, important question. I think one thing that was made clear in episode one is that ABT is more than just exercise. So it's more than just doing activity to improve exercise capacity. It's actually teaching the parts of the body that have lost some abilities to relearn movement, to teach the neuromotor system to relearn movement. That can be done in many different ways. It can be done uh, by having therapists assisting leg movements when someone with spinal cord injury is walking on a treadmill. But then you need two people. It's very difficult to make the movements and you don't always show exactly the movement you want. Another way is to use uh, devices that can register if you want the proper movements ahead of time and then teach them to the person one step at a time. And that is robotic training. Now. How do you go from robotic training, which could be done very slowly, to ABT? ABT requires that you deliver that robotic training at a certain pace. And this is where modern exoskeletons now have enough power to provide movements at a much faster rate. So that would be an intermediate step where you can bring up the speed of the movement and increase the number of repetitions. 
Ideally, what you would want to do is then to move this robotic training out in the corridor, out in the real world, if you want, and then walk over ground. And this is where exoskeletons, wearable exoskeletons that we have nowadays, can perform and can help people get into a, a sufficient level of activity that will trigger what is activity-based therapy. So you combine the movement teaching ability of the system with the intensity and you get the best way to stimulate neuroplasticity, I think. So it's okay. very exciting times. Definitely. So you've provided a really good background on robotics and how the exoskeleton can provide ABT. But can you describe a little bit more about the exoskeleton, what it looks like and how it works? Yeah. So an exoskeleton can look like a, a term coming out of science fiction, but it's really a device that exists. Basically, it is a device that someone can wear and that can be self-sustaining in terms of weight. So when you get into the device, it can sustain its own weight and your, and your own weight. So it's a, a frame that you wear around your body and that can move with you. That's the first part of the exoskeleton, self-supporting structure. It's most of the time a device that's active, that is, it's uh, actuated, it, it makes movement based on the activation of motors that are located on at each joint. So when a person walks with an exoskeleton, they're in this frame with motors at the joints and with a battery that will drive the motors. It also has internal sensors to measure the movements as they go and also to measure the amount of force that the person inside the device can provide. So it's a complete system that can sense how much help you need to make the movement and that can provide that help so that the proper movement is executed. There are different kinds of exoskeletons and there are different kinds of use of exoskeletons. So some exoskeletons are very bulky, very big, and they are used over a treadmill for people who have no standing ability and sometimes absolutely no motor output. So it really helps them make the complete movement. There are smaller exoskeletons that can be used over ground to assist residual function and help people make the movement better for longer or with less fatigue. There's even devices that also have built-in uh, functional electrical stimulation abilities to help contract the muscles on top of having the robotic sites. So there's a continuum of devices. I think it's important to mention here that there are two main uses of uh, exoskeletons. One is a device to help people relearn how to make movements. So in other words, a device that will be used for training, training your neuromotor system, so that when you move out of the exoskeleton, you're better at walking, for example, or you're better at doing upper limb movements. So that's a training device, a device that will be used to uh, make movement repetitions at high intensity so that you become better when you're out of it. This is what the way we use it in ABT. But it can also be used as an assistive device. So for people who have no motor return, you can also use exoskeletons to replace what they cannot do. But that's a completely different use. It will target different people uh, uh, among the spinal cord population. And sometimes it can be confusing because... Uh, you know, when should someone be trained or when should someone use the device all the time? And that's the role of the therapist <laughs> to decide if you have enough residual capacity to be trained, then you might go into a rehab center and have a couple of sessions a week on the exoskeleton to retrain your system, your nervous system walking better so that when you go home, you'll be more efficient. In other cases, you might be recommended to use it as an assistive device and then you would wear the device all the time. You mentioned a few things. I'm a little more familiar with the body weight supported treadmill system. So you mentioned a few similarities there. So basically balancing the person's body weight, you could say, or uh, just helping them to improve uh, according to their level of function. This leads into our next question, which is, do you use the exoskeleton more often with people who have paraplegia or tetraplegia? And how is that different? So uh, this is another very good question. If you have a certain level of motor return, you can then uh, be eligible 
for what I would say gait retraining, movement retraining. It could be people incomplete injury that can be high or low. What you need if you want the full extent of the training capacity is if you have enough ability with your upper limbs to help balancing yourself, then you can be involved in studies where you can use exoskeletons over ground. In other cases, maybe all you want is to train the rhythmicity of the person and to increase muscle mass and to get the person more fit than someone with a more extensive injury or with less motor return could also be involved in this type of study, which would be more like the body weight support system where you have this big device on a treadmill and you make the movement. In that case, what you do is you build muscle mass. You're not that much into the neuromotor training, but there could be benefits there, for example, for diabetes or for other secondary complications. In the case of ABT, we're concentrating on people with incomplete injuries who have some motor return who could benefit from neuroplasticity training. Yeah. So when I've had conversations about technology and ABT, often people will comment about the time it takes to set up various types of technology. So for the exoskeleton, I'm just wondering how long is the setup time and how do you think the potential setup time is balanced by the potential therapeutic benefits? Uh, so that's a question. If you ask me uh, two years from now, we'll have a different answer. Basically, <laughs> <laughs> technology evolves. The, the time it takes to get into the device gets smaller. At the moment, I would say to get a completely well-fit person into the device takes about 20 minutes, which is out of a one-hour physiotherapy session might look like a, a lot of time. However, with the device, we expect to deliver, I would say, 1,200 steps of, of training in comparison to about 200 to 300 without the device. So if the person responds well to the machine, so if the human machine interface is good, which is the case for most of our patients, uh, it is worth taking the 20 minutes to get into the device because you get that much more intensity and that much more repetitions. Just as a physical therapist myself, too, I also think of the potential it has for therapists for safety reasons and then longevity of the physical therapist or occupational therapist career, too. Yes. So that's a, a, another issue. So it takes a lot of people to get the person inside the device. So at the moment of installation, maybe you need two. So maybe a physiotherapist and a physiotherapist assistant at the time of, of setup. But then you're right that the machine does all the movement help. It's not the therapist. So yes, that is good for the therapist also. Okay, so on to my last question. So where do you think that the exoskeleton has a future in ABT and SCI rehabilitation? So is it an acute hospital rehab or community rehab or a mix? At the moment, I think for neuro rehabilitation, for ABT related uh, training, mm -hmm. I think the best place is in the rehabilitation center. However, things are moving fast in this field. And I see rehabilitative training, motor rehabilitative training as a continuum from the acute to the community. So I think shortly in the future, as the devices become cheaper and smaller and easier to set up, we might see some of them being available in the community. It would be in community settings where people still come to train like a specialized training center. So at the moment, yes, in the rehabilitation clinic during intensive rehabilitation therapy. This is where the devices are used. In the future, if we have a bit cheaper and more accessible devices, I would see that in the community, people coming and being part of groups that meet at the rehab center and you know can exchange on their own training program and on, on their own advancement and how they can help each other. That's something I would like to see within the next five to 10 years. I think it's a reasonable dream. And on the other side, in the acute setup, I think a good preparation for the exoskeleton would be to have more of the FES cycling, for example. There are a couple of studies right now that are being carried out across the country to see how early you can start people, you know, pedaling, starting to get the stepping going so that when they get into their subacute phase, they're more ready to receive ABT type training. So a continuum, mostly in the rehab center, 
and crossing our fingers in the community soon. Well, thank you, Dr. Boyer. That was fantastic. And I would love to see um, exoskeleton used in the community in the near future. And just want to thank you for coming in today and good luck with all your research. Thank you for listening. Our next show will feature three guests who talk about spinal cord stimulation and activity-based therapy and a model for implementing activity-based therapy across the healthcare continuum. You can link to Spinal Moves and get more information about ABT and the Canadian Community of Practice at praxisinstitute.org. Or you can also listen to Spinal Moves on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and other popular platforms. This series is brought to you by the Canadian Community of Practice. The series is sponsored by Praxis Spinal Cord Institute, a Canadian-based not-for-profit that leads global collaboration in spinal cord injury research, innovation, and care. Special thanks to the Saskatchewan Centre for Patient Outreach. Spinal Moves was created by Hope Jervis Rademeyer. Produced by Hope Jervis Rademeyer, Praxis Spinal Cord Institute, and Anita Kaiser. The information provided on Spinal Moves is of a general nature and cannot substitute for the advice of a medical or healthcare professional. The opinions expressed on the show are solely that of the host and individual contributors. None of the individual contributors, system operators, developers, sponsors of Spinal Moves, nor anyone else connected to Spinal Moves can take any responsibility for the results or consequences of any attempt to use or adopt any of the information presented through this podcast.